Radiation Therapy, Wikipedia Article Audio Radiation therapy or radiotherapy, often abbreviated RT, RTX, or XRT, is therapy using ionizing radiation, generally as part of cancer treatment to control or kill malignant cells and normally delivered by a linear accelerator. Radiation therapy may be curative in a number of types of cancer if they are localized to one area of the body. It may also be used as part of adjuvant therapy, to prevent tumor recurrence after surgery to remove a primary malignant tumor. Radiation therapy is synergistic with chemotherapy, and has been used before, during, and after chemotherapy in susceptible cancers. The subspecialty of oncology concerned with radiotherapy is called radiation oncology. Radiation therapy is commonly applied to the cancerous tumor because of its ability to control cell growth. Ionizing radiation works by damaging the DNA of cancerous tissue leading to cellular death. To spare normal tissues, Shaped radiation beams are aimed from several angles of exposure to intersect at the tumor, providing a much larger absorbed dose there than in the surrounding, healthy tissue. Besides the tumor itself, the radiation fields may also include the draining lymph nodes if they are clinically or radiologically involved with tumor, or if there is thought to be a risk of subclinical malignant spread. It is necessary to include a margin of normal tissue around the tumor to allow for uncertainties in daily setup and internal tumor motion. These uncertainties can be caused by internal movement and movement of external skin marks relative to the tumor position. Medical Uses Side Effects Radiation oncology is the medical specialty concerned with prescribing radiation and is distinct from radiology, the use of radiation in medical imaging and diagnosis. Radiation may be prescribed by a radiation oncologist with intent to cure or for adjuvant therapy. It may also be used as palliative treatment or as therapeutic treatment. It is also common to combine radiation therapy with surgery, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, immunotherapy, or some mixture of the four. Most common cancer types can be treated with radiation therapy in some way. The precise treatment intent will depend on the tumor type, location, and stage, as well as the general health of the patient. Total body irradiation is a radiation therapy technique used to prepare the body to receive a bone marrow transplant. Brachytherapy, in which a radioactive source is placed inside or next to the area requiring treatment, is another form of radiation therapy that minimizes exposure to healthy tissue during procedures to treat cancers of the breast, prostate, and other organs. Radiation therapy has several applications in non-malignant conditions, such as the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, acoustic neuromas, severe thyroid eye disease, pterygium, pigmented villonodular synovitis, and prevention of keloid scar growth, vascular restenosis, and heterotopic ossification. The use of radiation therapy in non-malignant conditions is limited partly by worries about the risk of radiation-induced cancers. Different cancers respond to radiation therapy in different ways. The response of a cancer to radiation is described by its radiosensitivity. Highly radiosensitive cancer cells are rapidly killed by modest doses of radiation. These include leukemias, most lymphomas, and germ cell tumors. The majority of epithelial cancers are only moderately radiosensitive, and require a significantly higher dose of radiation to achieve a radical cure. Some types of cancer are notably radioresistant, that is, much higher doses are required to produce a radical cure than may be safe in clinical practice. 
Renal cell cancer and melanoma are generally considered to be radioresistant but radiation therapy is still a palliative option for many patients with metastatic melanoma. Combining radiation therapy with immunotherapy is an active area of investigation and has shown some promise for melanoma and other cancers. It is important to distinguish the radiosensitivity of a particular tumor, which to some extent is a laboratory measure, from the radiation curability of a cancer in actual clinical practice. For example, Leukemias are not generally curable with radiation therapy, because they are disseminated through the body. Lymphoma may be radically curable if it is localized to one area of the body. Similarly, many of the common, moderately radioresponsive tumors are routinely treated with curative doses of radiation therapy if they are at an early stage. For example, Non-melanoma skin cancer, head and neck cancer, breast cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, cervical cancer, anal cancer, and prostate cancer. Metastatic cancers are generally incurable with radiation therapy because it is not possible to treat the whole body. Acute Side Effects Before Treatment a CT scan is often performed to identify the tumor and surrounding normal structures. The patient receives small skin marks to guide the placement of treatment fields. Patient positioning is crucial at this stage as the patient will have to be set up in the identical position during treatment. Many patient positioning devices have been developed for this purpose including masks and cushions which can be molded to the patient. The response of a tumor to radiation therapy is also related to its size. Due to complex radiobiology, very large tumors respond less well to radiation than smaller tumors or microscopic disease. Various strategies are used to overcome this effect. The most common technique is surgical resection prior to radiation therapy. This is most commonly seen in the treatment of breast cancer with wide local excision or mastectomy followed by adjuvant radiation therapy. Another method is to shrink the tumor with neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to radical radiation therapy. A third technique is to enhance the radiosensitivity of the cancer by giving certain drugs during a course of radiation therapy. Examples of radiosensitizing drugs include, cisplatin, nimirazole, and ketuximab. Late Side Effects The effect of radiotherapy on control of cancer has been shown to be limited to the first five years after surgery particularly for breast cancer. The difference between breast cancer recurrence in patients who receive radiotherapy versus those who don't is seen mostly in the first 2-3 years and no difference is seen after 5 years. This is explained in detail here. Radiation therapy is in itself painless. Many low-dose palliative treatments cause minimal or no side effects. Although short-term pain flare-up can be experienced in the days following treatment due to edema compressing nerves in the treated area. Higher doses can cause varying side effects during treatment, in the months or years following treatment, or after retreatment. The nature, severity, and longevity of side effects depends on the organs that receive the radiation, the treatment itself, and the patient. Most side effects are predictable and expected. Side effects from radiation are usually limited to the area of the patient's body that is under treatment. Side effects are dose-dependent, for example higher doses of head and neck radiation can be associated with cardiovascular complications, thyroid dysfunction, and pituitary axis dysfunction. Modern radiation therapy aims to reduce side effects to a minimum and to help the patient understand and deal with side effects that are unavoidable. Cumulative Side Effects 
The main side effects reported are fatigue and skin irritation, like a mild to moderate sunburn. The fatigue often sets in during the middle of a course of treatment and can last for weeks after treatment ends. The irritated skin will heal, but may not be as elastic as it was before. Effects on Reproduction Late side effects occur months to years after treatment and are generally limited to the area that has been treated. They are often due to damage of blood vessels and connective tissue cells. Many late effects are reduced by fractionating treatment into smaller parts. Effects on pituitary system Cumulative effects from this process should not be confused with long-term effects when short-term effects have disappeared and long-term effects are subclinical, re-irradiation can still be problematic. These doses are calculated by the radiation oncologist and many factors are taken into account before the subsequent radiation takes place. During the first two weeks after fertilization, radiation therapy is lethal but not teratogenic. High doses of radiation during pregnancy induce anomalies, impaired growth, and intellectual disability and there may be an increased risk of childhood leukemia and other tumors in the offspring. Radiation Therapy Accidents In males previously having undergone radiotherapy, there appears to be no increase in genetic defects or congenital malformations in their children conceived after therapy. However, the use of assisted reproductive technologies and micromanipulation techniques might increase this risk. Hypopituitarism commonly develops after radiation therapy for cellar and paracellar neoplasms, extracellar brain tumors, head and neck tumors, and following whole body irradiation for systemic malignancies. Radiation-induced hypopituitarism mainly affects growth hormone and gonadal hormones. In contrast, adrenocorticotrophic hormone and thyroid-stimulating hormone deficiencies are the least common among people with radiation-induced hypopituitarism. Changes in prolactin secretion is usually mild and vasopressin deficiency appears to be very rare as a consequence of radiation. There are rigorous procedures in place to minimize the risk of accidental overexposure of radiation therapy to patients. However, mistakes do occasionally occur, for example, the radiation therapy machine Therac 25 was responsible for at least six accidents between 1985 and 1987, where patients were given up to 100 times the intended dose. Two people were killed directly by the radiation overdoses. From 2005 to 2010, a hospital in Missouri overexposed 76 patients during a five-year period because new radiation equipment had been set up incorrectly. Although medical errors are exceptionally rare, radiation oncologists Medical physicists and other members of the radiation therapy treatment team are working to eliminate them. Astro has launched a safety initiative called Target Safely that, among other things, aims to record errors nationwide so that doctors can learn from each and every mistake and prevent them from happening. Astro also publishes a list of questions for patients to ask their doctors about radiation safety to ensure every treatment is as safe as possible. Radiation therapy is used to treat early-stage Dupuytren's disease and Lederhose disease. When Dupuytren's disease is at the nodules and cords stage or fingers are at a minimal deformation stage of less than 10 degrees, then radiation therapy is used to prevent further progress of the disease. Radiation therapy is also used post-surgery in some cases to prevent the disease continuing to progress. Low doses of radiation are used typically 3 gray of radiation for 5 days, with a break of 3 months followed by another phase of 3 gray of radiation for 5 days. 
Radiation therapy works by damaging the DNA of cancerous cells. This DNA damage is caused by one of two types of energy, photon, or charged particle. This damage is either direct or indirect ionization of the atoms which make up the DNA chain. Indirect ionization happens as a result of the ionization of water, forming free radicals, notably hydroxyl radicals, which then damage the DNA. Use in non-cancerous diseases In photon therapy, most of the radiation effect is through free radicals. Cells have mechanisms for repairing single-strand DNA damage and double-stranded DNA damage. However, double-stranded DNA breaks are much more difficult to repair, and can lead to dramatic chromosomal abnormalities and genetic deletions. Targeting double-stranded breaks increases the probability that cells will undergo cell death. Cancer cells are generally less differentiated and more stem cell-like, they reproduce more than most healthy differentiated cells, and have a diminished ability to repair sublethal damage. Single-strand DNA damage is then passed on through cell division, damage to the cancer cell's DNA accumulates, causing them to die or reproduce more slowly. Technique one of the major limitations of photon radiation therapy is that the cells of solid tumors become deficient in oxygen. Solid tumors can outgrow their blood supply, causing a low oxygen state known as hypoxia. Oxygen is a potent radio sensitizer, increasing the effectiveness of a given dose of radiation by forming DNA damaging free radicals. Tumor cells in a hypoxic environment may be as much as two to three times more resistant to radiation damage than those in a normal oxygen environment. Much research has been devoted to overcoming hypoxia including the use of high-pressure oxygen tanks, hyperthermia therapy, blood substitutes that carry increased oxygen, hypoxic cell radiosensitizer drugs such as misinidazole and metronidazole, and hypoxic cytotoxins, such as tyrapazamine. Newer research approaches are currently being studied, including preclinical and clinical investigations into the use of an oxygen diffusion enhancing compound such as transsodium crocetinate as a radio sensitizer. External beam radiation therapy or teletherapy, brachytherapy or sealed source radiation therapy, and systemic radioisotope therapy or unsealed source radiotherapy. Charged particles such as protons and boron, carbon and neon ions can cause direct damage to cancer cell DNA through high lead and have an anti-tumor effect independent of tumor oxygen supply because these particles act mostly via direct energy transfer usually causing double-stranded DNA breaks. Due to their relatively large mass, protons and other charged particles have little lateral side scatter in the tissue the beam does not broaden much, stays focused on the tumor shape, and delivers small dose side effects to surrounding tissue. They also more precisely target the tumor using the Bragg peak effect. See proton therapy for a good example of the different effects of intensity modulated radiation therapy versus charged particle therapy. This procedure reduces damage to healthy tissue between the charged particle radiation source and the tumor and sets a finite range for tissue damage after the tumor has been reached. In contrast, IMRT's use of uncharged particles causes its energy to damage healthy cells when it exits the body. This exiting damage is not therapeutic, can increase treatment side effects, and increases the probability of secondary cancer induction. This difference is very important in cases where the close proximity of other organs makes any stray ionization very damaging. This X-ray exposure is especially bad for children, due to their growing bodies, 
and they have a 30% chance of a second malignancy after 5 years post-initial route. The amount of radiation used in photon radiation therapy is measured in gray, and varies depending on the type and stage of cancer being treated. For curative cases, the typical dose for a solid epithelial tumor ranges from 60 to 80 GY, while lymphomas are treated with 20 to 40 GY. Preventive doses are typically around 45-60 GY in 1.82 GY fractions. Many other factors are considered by radiation oncologists when selecting a dose, including whether the patient is receiving chemotherapy, patient comorbidities, whether radiation therapy is being administered before or after surgery, and the degree of success of surgery. Mechanism of Action Dose Types External Beam Radiation Therapy Delivery parameters of a prescribed dose are determined during treatment planning. Treatment planning is generally performed on dedicated computers using specialized treatment planning software. Depending on the radiation delivery method, several angles or sources may be used to sum to the total necessary dose. The planner will try to design a plan that delivers a uniform prescription dose to the tumor and minimizes dose to surrounding healthy tissues. In radiation therapy, Three-dimensional dose distributions are often evaluated using the dosimetry technique known as gel dosimetry. The total dose is fractionated for several important reasons. Fractionation allows normal cells time to recover, while tumor cells are generally less efficient in repair between fractions. Fractionation also allows tumor cells that were in a relatively radioresistant phase of the cell cycle during one treatment to cycle into a sensitive phase of the cycle before the next fraction is given. Similarly, tumor cells that were chronically or acutely hypoxic may reoxygenate between fractions, improving the tumor cell kill. Fractionation regimens are individualized between different radiation therapy centers and even between individual doctors. In North America, Australia, and Europe, the typical fractionation schedule for adults is 1.8 to 2 GY per day, 5 days a week. In some cancer types, Prolongation of the fraction schedule over too long can allow for the tumor to begin repopulating and for these tumor types, including head and neck and cervical squamous cell cancers, radiation treatment is preferably completed within a certain amount of time. For children, a typical fraction size may be 1.5 to 1.8 GY per day, as smaller fraction sizes are associated with reduced incidence and severity of late-onset side effects in normal tissues. In some cases, two fractions per day are used near the end of a course of treatment. This schedule, known as a concomitant boost regimen or hyperfractionation, is used on tumors that regenerate more quickly when they are smaller. In particular, tumors in the head and neck demonstrate this behavior. Patients receiving palliative radiation to treat uncomplicated painful bone metastasis should not receive more than a single fraction of radiation. A single treatment gives comparable pain relief and morbidity outcomes to multiple fraction treatments, and for patients with limited life expectancy, a single treatment is best to improve patient comfort. One fractionation schedule that is increasingly being used and continues to be studied is hypofractionation. This is a radiation treatment in which the total dose of radiation is divided into large doses. Typical doses vary significantly by cancer type, from 2.2 GY fraction to 20 GY fraction. 
The logic behind hypofractionation is to lessen the possibility of the cancer returning by not giving the cells enough time to reproduce and also to exploit the unique biological radiation sensitivity of some tumors. Conventional External Beam Radiation Therapy Historically, the three main divisions of radiation therapy are the differences relate to the position of the radiation source, external is outside the body, brachytherapy uses sealed radioactive sources placed precisely in the area under treatment, and systemic radioisotopes are given by infusion or oral ingestion. Brachytherapy can use temporary or permanent placement of radioactive sources. The temporary sources are usually placed by a technique called afterloading. In afterloading a hollow tube or applicator is placed surgically in the organ to be treated, and the sources are loaded into the applicator after the applicator is implanted. This minimizes radiation exposure to healthcare personnel. Particle therapy is a special case of external beam radiation therapy where the particles are protons or heavier ions. Stereotactic radiation Virtual simulation, and three-dimensional conformal radiation therapy Intensity modulated radiation therapy The following three sections refer to treatment using X-rays. Conventional external beam radiation therapy is delivered via two-dimensional beams using kilovoltage therapy X-ray units or medical linear accelerators which generate high-energy X-rays. 2D XRT mainly consists of a single beam of radiation delivered to the patient from several directions, often front or back, and both sides. Conventional refers to the way the treatment is planned or simulated on a specially calibrated diagnostic X-ray machine known as a simulator because it recreates the linear accelerator actions, and to the usually well-established arrangements of the radiation beams to achieve a desired plan. The aim of simulation is to accurately target or localize the volume which is to be treated. This technique is well established and is generally quick and reliable. The worry is that some high-dose treatments may be limited by the radiation toxicity capacity of healthy tissues which lie close to the target tumor volume. An example of this problem is seen in radiation of the prostate gland, where the sensitivity of the adjacent rectum limited the dose which could be safely prescribed using 2D XRT planning to such an extent that tumor control may not be easily achievable. Prior to the invention of the CT, physicians and physicists had limited knowledge about the true radiation dosage delivered to both cancerous and healthy tissue. For this reason, Three-dimensional conformal radiation therapy is becoming the standard treatment for a number of tumor sites. More recently other forms of imaging are used including MRI, PET, SPECT, and ultrasound. Stereotactic radiation is a specialized type of external beam radiation therapy. It uses focused radiation beams targeting a well-defined tumor using extremely detailed imaging scans. Radiation oncologists perform stereotactic treatments, often with the help of a neurosurgeon for tumors in the brain or spine. There are two types of stereotactic radiation. Stereotactic radiosurgery is when doctors use a single or several stereotactic radiation treatments of the brain or spine. Stereotactic body radiation therapy refers to one or several stereotactic radiation treatments with the body, such as the lungs. Some doctors say an advantage to stereotactic treatments is that they deliver the right amount of radiation to the cancer in a shorter amount of time than traditional treatments, which can often take 6 to 11 weeks. Plus treatments are given with extreme accuracy, which should limit the effect of the radiation on healthy tissues. 
One problem with stereotactic treatments is that they are only suitable for certain small tumors. Volumetric Modulated Arc Therapy Stereotactic treatments can be confusing because many hospitals call the treatments by the name of the manufacturer rather than calling it SRS or SBRT. Brand names for these treatments include Axis, Cyberknife, Gamma Knife, Novalis, Primatum, Synergy, X-Knife, Tomotherapy, Trilogy and Truebeam. This list changes as equipment manufacturers continue to develop new, specialized technologies to treat cancers. The planning of radiation therapy treatment has been revolutionized by the ability to delineate tumors and adjacent normal structures in three dimensions using specialized CT and slash or MRI scanners and planning software. Virtual Simulation the most basic form of planning, allows more accurate placement of radiation beams than is possible using conventional X-rays, where soft tissue structures are often difficult to assess and normal tissues difficult to protect. An enhancement of virtual simulation is three-dimensional conformal radiation therapy, in which the profile of each radiation beam is shaped to fit the profile of the target from a beam's eye view using a multi-leaf collimator and a variable number of beams. When the treatment volume conforms to the shape of the tumor, the relative toxicity of radiation to the surrounding normal tissues is reduced, allowing a higher dose of radiation to be delivered to the tumor than conventional techniques would allow. Intensity modulated radiation therapy is an advanced type of high precision radiation that is the next generation of 3D CRT. IMRT also improves the ability to conform the treatment volume to concave tumor shapes, for example when the tumor is wrapped around a vulnerable structure such as the spinal cord or a major organ or blood vessel. Computer-controlled X-ray accelerators distribute precise radiation doses to malignant tumors or specific areas within the tumor. The pattern of radiation delivery is determined using highly tailored computing applications to perform optimization and treatment simulation. The radiation dose is consistent with the 3D shape of the tumor by controlling, or modulating, the radiation beam's intensity. The radiation dose intensity is elevated near the gross tumor volume while radiation among the neighboring normal tissues is decreased or avoided completely. This results in better tumor targeting, lessened side effects, and improved treatment outcomes than even 3D CRT. 3D CRT is still used extensively for many body sites but the use of IMRT is growing in more complicated body sites such as CNS, head and neck, prostate, breast, and lung. Unfortunately, IMRT is limited by its need for additional time from experienced medical personnel. This is because physicians must manually delineate the tumor's one CT image at a time through the entire disease site which can take much longer than 3D CRT preparation. Then, medical physicists and dosimetrists must be engaged to create a viable treatment plan. Also, the IMRT technology has only been used commercially since the late 1990s even at the most advanced cancer centers, so radiation oncologists who did not learn it as part of their residency programs must find additional sources of education before implementing IMRT. Proof of improved survival benefit from either of these two techniques over conventional radiation therapy is growing for many tumor sites but the ability to reduce toxicity is generally accepted. This is particularly the case for head and neck cancers in a series of pivotal trials performed by Professor Christopher Nutting of the Royal Marsden Hospital. Both techniques enable dose escalation, potentially increasing usefulness. There has been some concern, particularly with IMRT 
about increased exposure of normal tissue to radiation and the consequent potential for secondary malignancy. Overconfidence in the accuracy of imaging may increase the chance of missing lesions that are invisible on the planning scans or that move between or during a treatment. New techniques are being developed to better control this uncertainty for example, real-time imaging combined with real-time adjustment of the therapeutic beams. This new technology is called image-guided radiation therapy or four-dimensional radiation therapy. Another technique is the real-time tracking and localization of one or more small implantable electric devices implanted inside or close to the tumor. There are various types of medical implantable devices that are used for this purpose. It can be a magnetic transponder which senses the magnetic field generated by several transmitting coils, and then transmits the measurements back to the positioning system to determine the location. The implantable device can also be a small wireless transmitter sending out an RF signal which then will be received by a sensor array and used for localization and real-time tracking of the tumor position. Volumetric modulated arc therapy is a new radiation technique, which can achieve highly conformal dose distributions on target volume coverage and sparing of normal tissues. The specificity of this technique is to modify the three parameters during the treatment. VMAT delivers radiation by rotating gantry, changing speed and shape of the beam with a multi-leaf collimator and fluence output rate of the medical linear accelerator. VMAT also has the potential to give additional advantages in patient treatment, such as reduced delivery time of radiation compared with conventional static field intensity modulated radiotherapy. In particle therapy, energetic ionizing particles are directed at the target tumor. The dose increases while the particle penetrates the tissue, up to a maximum that occurs near the end of the particle's range, and it then drops to zero. The advantage of this energy deposition profile is that less energy is deposited into the healthy tissue surrounding the target tissue. Particle therapy Auger therapy Auger therapy makes use of a very high dose of ionizing radiation in situ that provides molecular modifications at an atomic scale. That differs from conventional radiation therapy in several aspects. It neither relies upon radioactive nuclei to cause cellular radiation damage at a cellular dimension, nor engages multiple external pencil beams from different directions to zero in to deliver a dose to the targeted area with reduced dose outside the targeted tissue-slash-organ locations. Instead, the in situ delivery of a very high dose at the molecular level using it aims for in situ molecular modifications involving molecular breakages and molecular rearrangements such as a change of stacking structures as well as cellular metabolic functions related to the said molecule structures. Contact X-ray brachytherapy is a type of radiation therapy using X-rays applied close to the tumor to treat rectal cancer. The process involves inserting the X-ray tube through the anus into the rectum and placing it against the cancerous tissue, then high doses of X-rays are emitted directly into the tumor at two weekly intervals. It is typically used for treating early rectal cancer in patients who may not be candidates for surgery. A 2015 NICE review found the main side effect to be bleeding that occurred in about 38% of cases, and radiation-induced ulcer which occurred in 27% of cases. Contact X-ray brachytherapy Brachytherapy is delivered by placing radiation source inside or next to the area requiring treatment. Brachytherapy is commonly used as an effective treatment for cervical, prostate, breast, and skin cancer and can also be used to treat tumors in many other body sites. Brachytherapy Unsealed Source Radiotherapy 
Intraoperative Radiotherapy Rationale Deep Inspiration Breath Hold History In brachytherapy, radiation sources are precisely placed directly at the site of the cancerous tumor. This means that the irradiation only affects a very localized area exposure to radiation of healthy tissues further away from the sources is reduced. These characteristics of brachytherapy provide advantages over external beam radiation therapy the tumor can be treated with very high doses of localized radiation, whilst reducing the probability of unnecessary damage to surrounding healthy tissues. A course of brachytherapy can often be completed in less time than other radiation therapy techniques. This can help reduce the chance of surviving cancer cells dividing and growing in the intervals between each radiation therapy dose. As one example of the localized nature of breast brachytherapy, the SAVI device delivers the radiation dose through multiple catheters, each of which can be individually controlled. This approach decreases the exposure of healthy tissue and resulting side effects compared both to external beam radiation therapy and older methods of breast brachytherapy. Systemic radioisotope therapy is a form of targeted therapy. Targeting can be due to the chemical properties of the isotope such as radioiodine which is specifically absorbed by the thyroid gland a thousandfold better than other bodily organs. Targeting can also be achieved by attaching the radioisotope to another molecule or antibody to guide it to the target tissue. The radioisotopes are delivered through infusion or ingestion. Examples are the infusion of metaeodobenzyl geoanidine to treat neuroblastoma, of oral iodine-131 to treat thyroid cancer or thyrotoxicosis and of hormone-bound lutetium-177 and yttrium-90 to treat neuroendocrine tumors. Another example is the injection of yttrium-90 radioactive glass or resin microspheres into the hepatic artery to radioembolize liver tumors or liver metastases. These microspheres are used for the treatment approach known as selective internal radiation therapy. The microspheres are approximately 30 m in diameter and are delivered directly into the artery supplying blood to the tumors. These treatments begin by guiding a catheter up through the femoral artery in the leg, navigating to the desired target site and administering treatment. The blood feeding the tumor will carry the microspheres directly to the tumor enabling a more selective approach than traditional systemic chemotherapy. There are currently two different kinds of microspheres, surspheres and therosphere. A major use of systemic radioisotope therapy is in the treatment of bone metastasis from cancer. The radioisotopes travel selectively to areas of damaged bone, and spare normal undamaged bone. Isotopes commonly used in the treatment of bone metastasis are strontium-89 and samarium lexidronum. In 2002, the United States Food and Drug Administration approved ibrutumumab tioxetin, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody conjugated to yttrium-90. In 2003, the FDA approved the tocitumumab slash iodine tocitumumab regimen, which is a combination of an iodine-131 labeled and an unlabeled anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. These medications were the first agents of what is known as radioimmunotherapy, and they were approved for the treatment of refractory non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Intraoperative radiation therapy is applying therapeutic levels of radiation to a target area, such as a cancer tumor, while the area is exposed during surgery. The rationale for IORT is to deliver a high dose of radiation precisely to the targeted area with minimal exposure of surrounding tissues which are displaced or shielded during the IORT. 
Conventional radiation techniques such as external beam radiotherapy following surgical removal of the tumor have several drawbacks. The tumor bed where the highest dose should be applied is frequently missed due to the complex localization of the wound cavity even when modern radiotherapy planning is used. Additionally, the usual delay between the surgical removal of the tumor and EBRT may allow a repopulation of the tumor cells. These potentially harmful effects can be avoided by delivering the radiation more precisely to the targeted tissues leading to immediate sterilization of residual tumor cells. Another aspect is that wound fluid has a stimulating effect on tumor cells. IORT was found to inhibit the stimulating effects of wound fluid. Deep inspiration breath hold is a method of delivering radiotherapy while limiting radiation exposure to the heart and lungs. It is used primarily for treating left-sided breast cancer. The technique involves a patient holding their breath during treatment. There are two basic methods of performing DIBH, free breathing breath hold and spirometry monitored deep inspiration breath hold. Medicine has used radiation therapy as a treatment for cancer for more than 100 years, with its earliest roots traced from the discovery of X-rays in 1895 by Wilhelm Röntgen. Emil Grubb of Chicago was possibly the first American physician to use X-rays to treat cancer, beginning in 1896. The field of radiation therapy began to grow in the early 1900s largely due to the groundbreaking work of Nobel Prize winning scientist Marie Curie, who discovered the radioactive elements polonium and radium in 1898. This began a new era in medical treatment and research. Through the 1920s the hazards of radiation exposure were not understood and little protection was used. Radium was believed to have wide curative powers and radiotherapy was applied to many diseases. Prior to World War II, the only practical sources of radiation for radiotherapy were radium and its emanation, radon gas, and the X-ray tube. External beam radiotherapy began at the turn of the century with relatively low-voltage X-ray machines. It was found that while superficial tumors could be treated with low-voltage X-rays, more penetrating, higher-energy beams were required to reach tumors inside the body, requiring higher voltages. Orthovoltage X-rays, which used tube voltages of 200 to 500 kV, began to be used during the 1920s. To reach the most deeply buried tumors without exposing intervening skin and tissue to dangerous radiation doses required rays with energies of 1 mV or above, called megavolt radiation. Producing megavolt X-rays required voltages on the X-ray tube of 3 to 5 million volts, which required huge expensive installations. Megavoltage X-ray units were first built in the late 1930s but because of cost were limited to a few institutions. One of the first, installed at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, London in 1937 and used until 1960, used a 30-foot long X-ray tube and weighed 10 tons. Radium produced megavolt gamma rays but was extremely rare and expensive due to its low occurrence in ores. In 1937 the entire world supply of radium for radiotherapy was 50 grams, valued at 800,000 pounds, or $50 million in 2005 dollars. The invention of the nuclear reactor in the Manhattan Project during World War II made possible the production of artificial radioisotopes for radiotherapy. Cobalt therapy, teletherapy machines using megavolt gamma rays emitted by cobalt-60, a radioisotope produced by irradiating ordinary cobalt metal in a reactor revolutionized the field between the 1950s and the early 1980s. 
Cobalt machines were relatively cheap, robust, and simple to use, although due to its 5.27-year half-life the cobalt had to be replaced about every five years. Medical linear particle accelerators, developed since the 1940s, began replacing X-ray and cobalt units in the 1980s and these older therapies are now declining. The first medical linear accelerator was used at the Hammersmith Hospital in London in 1953. Linear accelerators can produce higher energies, have more collimated beams, and do not produce radioactive waste with its attendant disposal problems like radioisotope therapies. With Godfrey Hounsfield's invention of computed tomography in 1971, three-dimensional planning became a possibility and created a shift from 2D to 3D radiation delivery. CT-based planning allows physicians to more accurately determine the dose distribution using axial tomographic images of the patient's anatomy. The advent of new imaging technologies, including magnetic resonance imaging in the 1970s and positron emission tomography in the 1980s, has moved radiation therapy from 3D conformal to intensity modulated radiation therapy and to image guided radiation therapy tomotherapy. These advances allowed radiation oncologists to better see and target tumors, which have resulted in better treatment outcomes, more organ preservation and fewer side effects. While access to radiotherapy is improving globally, more than half of patients in low- and middle-income countries still do not have available access to the therapy as of 2017.